Hello and welcome back to our NVIDIA GTC cover. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante. We're here, Dave, great to see you. We're here for the, uh, kind of the day two, but it's really day one, but all the sessions started, but it's really day two. Uh, Jensen just did his private briefing with the press and the analysts. Uh, we're here with ZS Carvella, ZK Research. Always great to have this analyst angle. Guys, thanks for, uh, for uh, joining me. Yeah, you're welcome, John. I mean, thanks for having us here. I mean, this is a, this is crazy. I mean, this is, <laughs> talk about Fire Marshal full. I mean, this place is packed, but you know, Jensen did a great job yesterday at the keynote, sort of making the case for big honking chips. And then we just sat, the three of us just sat through a masterclass. Jensen spoke for an hour, like straight for an hour, and then took Q&A from analysts for an hour. Every hand in the room was up, you got a question in. You know, I wasn't <laughs> able to get my question in, but, um, but so good job there, yeah. sitting right up front. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it just strikes me that they're playing in every part of the market, AI everywhere. And I, my takeaway from listening to yesterday and today is he's basically saying the same infrastructure is going to do both training and inference. Now, there's definitely a market, he talked about chiplets a little bit, very little bit, because people have been trying to deposition NVIDIA's monolithic approach. But there's real benefits to monolithic, and he talked about that, that every part talks to the memory, every part talks to each other, and we had to create a new communication system to be able to do that. So I, I think they are taking the, the high end of the market, and there's really nobody that, in my opinion, is going to touch them. Plus, they're also doing chiplet stuff with, with MediaTek. The other thing that I wanted to mention is, yesterday we heard about ANSYS, Synopsys, Cadence, no surprise, this rally is broadening, you know, and those companies are getting a lot of AI love. So it's just AI everywhere. Well, we're here in the run and gun cube, guys. We're uh, one camera, very tight footprint. We've got our cameras. I want to thank Noah and the team back in Palo Alto, making it all happen. We've got Howie Shu doing uh, founder AI uh, tracks at the studio. Obviously, it's AI's innovators, our big theme. Zias, uh, we chatted yesterday to kick off the event outside. We did a great remote out front with the Cube. Um, you, we just heard Jensen kind of go kind of deeper under the covers, more personable, a little bit more expansive on his one-on-one um, -on -one with the analysts. We were just in that room. We had a chance to sit with him and, and get that vibe. What was your big takeaway that was different than the keynote? If you could share uh, your thoughts. I and mean, you got a question, and congratulations. Yeah, well, he's super excited about it. And I think you know, to follow up on what, what Dave's points were, was you know, when you think about where NVIDIA came from as a chip company, there could have been a lot of limitations along the way, the network's not fast enough, memory doesn't get transmitted fast enough, that could have held them back. And it didn't because they solved it, <laughs> right? And in fact, uh, we talked a little bit about NVLink yesterday and NV Switch, where I think that's, I, I said to Jensen, I think it's the, the most underappreciated innovation from that company because it solved the network problem for inter, for interchip communications. And uh, I think when you, you're right, they're not a, Big honking chips is, I don't know, are they chips or are they systems, are they motherboards, are they servers, yes. right? It's all <laughs> those things together. In fact, when they showed the Blackwell video, starting with a the chip, then going to two chips, then going to a quad chip, to a motherboard, to a server, to a system, to a cluster of systems, right? That's really... Data center. Yeah, and, <laughs> and they build all of that together. And so are they vertically integrated? Sure. But when you think of, well, you know, up until this point, what's the best performing enterprise applications ever been? It's Oracle, right? And it's Oracle because it's a fully integrated vertical system. And when performance matters, okay. nothing engineered systems. Yeah, nothing outperforms <laughs> engineered systems. And so I think they've taken that right to the nth degree. And I, the, the thing that impresses me about NVIDIA is whatever limitations there are along the way, they fix them, right? And whether they have to reinvent networking or, you know, memory, they do that. And I think that's a, that's, it's not every company that can do that. You know, Dave, we, yeah. we're going to be sitting down tomorrow with Broadcom's um, financial analyst meetings here in San Jose, and we had Charlie Kwas on theCUBE at MWC, and you hear Jensen talk. Um, and one of the things that strikes me about this generation, these, these leaders in the chips, and, and switches actually, they have chips and switches, both of those companies, by the only companies that have both switch, <laughs> switches and chips, unique, Broadcom and NVIDIA. But their CEOs, they're computer science guys. So when they explain concepts, it's refreshing because I have you know, two degrees in computer science to hear the talk. And he's kind of simplifying computer science principles. And you can hear, you can see how much of their lead that they have. They've made big bets, un really quietly made big bets. You know, they put ray tracing and all the stuff. They have trans uh, 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 tensor core and all the millions of PCs. Um, uh, three years and 25,000 employees working on Black Blackwell. 
big bets in zero billion markets that become huge. Everyone thinks they see the success, but they don't see the failures. It just strikes me that they got it right and these bets are paying off and they have a huge lead, uh, these systems, uh, the way they're engineered. It's a data center basically as a service. They're selling us parts, he said. So really interesting that the moat that they have, Dave, is really their lead. What do you guys think about that? What's your reaction to that, to that whole size of the lead that they have in these markets? And what's real and what may not be as tight as a drum as you might think? Well, the, 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 the line that, that was an awesome line where he said, we are market makers, not share takers. So basically saying we're, we're creating markets. Now, believe me, they're taking share. They're taking <laughs> share from x86. That's like Broadcom saying right? they don't chase S-curve, but <laughs> right. they're on one. But I, exactly, <laughs> by, you know, by accident, by design. But so I think that their moat is substantial. I mean, I think when, you know, we've heard leading up to GTC, a lot of talk about, oh, monolithic and, and, and almost used as a pejorative. To me, monolithic's not a pejorative because you need, as Jensen said, you need bigger and bigger and bigger chips. And his point is, we share memory across all these components. Yeah. And so, we well, even talked about the cabling. You know, you talked about all the potential constraints. Cabling was one potential. They had to it, it basically invent some new switching t capabilities. And so, I think they're far ahead in packaging and obviously in chip design. I think they've got, you know, yield advantages with TSM. I mean, on and on and on. And just to hear Jensen talk, he doesn't talk like a chip manufacturer. He, he talks like a system uh, a, a design person, system thinking. And he really talks about you know, the future, the future of everything. And it's extremely impressive. And I think it really underscores their lead. Well, the other, the other part of the lead, though, is just the, the size of the developer community, right? When even if somebody else were to come up and build the software needed and the developer tools needed, how long would it take you to build that developer ecosystem? I think he said in the keynote yesterday, what was a 1.3 million robotic developers alone, right? So from a mode perspective, even if you were at par on the tech, which competitors aren't, it would take you, uh, what, a decade or so to, yeah. <laughs> to go accumulate all those developers? And so yeah. that's, uh, that, that's always been the heart of this company, I find, and really the most misunderstood part of, of NVIDIA is they've done the things they need to do to make it easy for developers, and other chip companies didn't, for whatever reason, see yeah. that, and you know, NVIDIA is really the one winning the war now. Actually, I loved your question about uh, accelerated computing and, and how you tied it to the network, but then he kind of went out on a tangent, and it got my attention, Dave, because Zias got that question in, but it sparked something in Jensen's head that he answered the question about IT, East-West traffic, and AI, but he actually went on this tangent where he talked about the um, AI acceleration to industries. He mentioned, and he kind of was not bragging, it's not bragging if it's true by the way, so he wasn't really bragging, he was saying, yeah, we have a lead and no one's really chasing us. But I think we're going to see a new dynamic with this accelerated computing that we've seen before, but not the same. Remember during the pandemic, uh, there was this concept that was uh, in the financial world was called pull forward revenue. Yeah, yeah. yeah the whole, the, you know, the pull forward opportunities that because of the pandemic created new use cases. And some thought they were mirages, some thought they were not sustainable, but they had a huge financial impact. So this pull forward impact that the pandemic had, AI's happening. So what he's basically saying today was, I heard him say was, we're pulling forward from the future, accelerating use cases with our AI, rather than net new invention, we're going to have incremental improvement and bring forward some of these advances faster. And he named multiple use cases almost in every industry. We've been kind of saying that, Dave, like AI is great in the industry. So I think this pull forward concept is going to be huge. I think it's going to have a material impact, not only on financial, but society. So I think your, this accelerated, accelerated computing, accelerated AI is going to absolutely have an impact. And again, you're starting to see the early signs of it. Now you get the systems and the hardware in place. The chip side, I love that big chip, build a big chip, because there's efficiencies with energy and chips. So there's huge advantages to the architecture, the business model, and then ultimately the impact. I think the concern, if I may, about the pull forward, and you use the pandemic, and I think this is a really good example, what happened in the pandemic is we got this sort of seesaw, slingshot effect, where everybody ramped up, and then everybody had to ramp down because it was uh, everything changed. And so people are obviously concerned about that pull forward effect. I mean, if you want a Blackwell, you got to sign up for Blackwell now, or you go back to the end of the line. So of course, who's signing up? AWS, Microsoft, <laughs> Google, Oracle, you know, Dell, et cetera. They're all saying, yeah, give us the chips. And so you may see that type of slingshot effect, but look, it's better to be, <laughs> 
it's better to be early and, and overbuilt than to, to be underbuilt and not be there to take advantage of the opportunity. And the other, the other key stat is, he talked about 25,000 engineers, you just said, over three years, $10 billion to build this thing. You know, so at 50,000 bucks a piece, you know, you're talking about, you know, a couple of years before he gets that payback. And then yeah. the other question that came up, somebody asked about software, like what's your software opportunity? He said, well, look, imagine we got a million GPUs out there at $4,500 a piece, you, you know, per, per GPU per year. Yeah, you're talking about a four or five billion dollar opportunity per year. They're going to make a lot of money. The thing I, I want to get you guys' thoughts on is that you mentioned a couple things. We're going to manufacture AI and LLMs at scale and create LLMs. We're going to be in the LLM creation business as well as working with others. Um, he mentioned um, someone's got to pay for this operating system. That's, he's hinting that they're the operating system for the future. But he started the whole thing with this new industrial revolution, and I find this interesting. I think NVIDIA is making a land grab for the token market, Dave. The tokens were, came up multiple times on the keynote. He drilled on it at the beginning of his keynote here in this new industrial revolution pitch where he said, the old world is pre-recorded. Like we think pre-recorded videos, you know, you, you get the news, it's pre-recorded, everything's pre-recorded, you got to fetch it, versus generative. Seeds of innovation. Data is seeds, the new seeds. Retrieval and versus generation. So I think this whole token economics redo, remember the old crypto days, Dave? ICOs and token economics? I think you're going to see a token currency, and I think they're smart to build the system to handle LLMs at scale, because he mentioned the word embeddings. He wants that embedding business. I think this is a big strategic move for NVIDIA to go after the tokens, because they can control that context window, they can control the reg, and ultimately the LLMs, and if they're the factory, they got to have the, the embeds, Dave. The embeds is going to be the core currency uh, for those tokens. So, um, do you guys, did you hear that? What's your reaction to that? I, yeah, no, I think ultimately the operating system analogy is, is the right one. Um, in fact, during his keynote, he talked about Omniverse being the operating system for digital twins. And he talked about LLMs, what they're doing there is being the, uh, really the effective, effectively the operating system for, for, for content generation. So, when you think of, once you're the operating system, then the ecosystems that get built on you become massive and create this pull-through effect from you, right? So, uh, I, I, I did like the, the, the comparison to operating system because I think it is the, an appropriate one, but uh, clearly as we move into this world where more and more stuff gets generated on the fly, I mean, that's, that's awfully hard for anybody else to do without owning the stack. What, what I like about Jensen, he obviously says some things over and over again, like AI factories and if you, if you buy, buy more, you save more. But he also introduces new content every time I see him talk. And I'll, and I'll give you some examples here. He talked about the world of generated content is here. And he, and he talked about how NVIDIA creates a lot of content, they, you know, formerly through graphics. And, now they're generating tons of content. Yeah, he you talked know. about that almost as being the renaissance for, yes. for the GPU, right? Because they started off as a company that created graphics and now they're creating all multimodal content. And right? he said so. Blackwell is built for this Gen AI yeah. moment. And then he went through this thing of talking about simulation versus animation and how you do, you do training and learning and generation and then you have to ground the AI in physics. And that's what Omniverse does. And so my point is, when Jensen talks, he talks with vision. When, when his competitors talk, they talk about, well, GPUs are really expensive and we're going to lower the cost of GPUs and you know, we're going to compete. He talks about how he's changing the world. None of the, he said, none of the stuff that I talk about was ever here before Gen AI. And yeah. this is all new. So his vision is really crisp and, and, and quite forward thinking. One of, one of the pieces he hinted at, at the end, that I wish he'd have spent more time on, was the sustainability impact of what NVIDIA is doing because that whenever I read you know media articles about what to expect, they uh, NVIDIA gets beat up a lot because I mean you know Blackwell uses a lot of power, but if you think about the workloads they're running, um, now it's a weird comparison because you wouldn't run those workloads without Blackwell, but now that you are, Blackwell uses a lot more power, but you can do things a lot more power efficiently. And so when he talked about embedding GPUs and AI into uh, cellular radios. Right, instead of just sort of upping the power all the time, uh, it can be a lot more, a lot smarter about how it does that. So, you know, are they using more power? Sure, but, uh, you know, we were talking about this on the way over, that your sort of, the, the power per transmitted packet goes way down. 
And that's the calculation to do. And I, I think that's an opportunity for NVIDIA. They really, they, he touches on a little bit, but given how important sustainability is, it's something yeah. he can drill down a lot more on. He does do a lot of, he just drops, he does drop a lot of nuggets because he's kind of off script, so he kind of slips in. Because we're, we're, of course, we're, we're reading every word and yeah. connecting the dots. Smart nicks and all nodes, you catch that one? Oh yeah. Okay, that was oh, good. Yeah, yeah. East, west, northwest <laughs> encryption, you brought that up in your question. But the smart nicks in, in all the nodes is a decoupling, and that really points to their success with MV Switch, Dave, because if you look at their success with the new chip, MV. it's unbelievable how they have that one chip that handles all the, the, the GPUs acting as one, and then now that the, the chip is switches, the switch chip is by itself, that's going to be a major innovation, and again, this is what we just talked about, M uh, MWC. The chips working together, I.O., low energy, good yield. This is a huge issue, because basically when people talk about these monolithic chips, what they're talking about is you have a, you have a huge SRAM that's shared amongst all these components, and those are synchronous connections, whereas, again, these alternative designs, people can't get yields out of what Jensen is doing, and somehow Jensen's and NVIDIA have figured out how to get yields. So what they do is they build you know, chiplets, which have, have, have their place, but they're asynchronous you know, connections, and yeah. by comparison, they're much, much slower. The other, the other mic drop moment, I thought, was, he said NVIDIA is the world's largest quantum computing company that doesn't build quantum computers. And then he, he went off and started talking he about- He was kind of dissing quantum. The, yeah, he kind he of was. saying we are quantum. He was saying ba basically AI is going to solve a lot of these problems. Except for now, use case, gonna, except for specific which was, use case and, things. Which was in encryption, quantum encryption. He yeah. said AI is not going to solve that, but he gave several examples which could be boiled down to pretty simple problem solving that he said AI was going to solve. He did shoot an uh, arrow across the ethernet bow. NV link can't did. go down. Super high quality. What do you think about Energy that? is low. So I, I asked about. <laughs> I said this morning to the uh, uh, to Kevin uh, Dearland, who runs networking. Uh, you know they announced uh, about the holy war between Ethernet and InfiniBand, and he said there's no holy war. But then he went on to say that you cannot use Ethernet <laughs> and AI. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> so you know there is a holy war going yeah, on here. Absolutely. I know all the network vendors are part of the Ultra Ethernet forum, but as you and I have talked about before, I've seen this movie before uh, where. You know, everyone wants Ethernet to replace InfiniBand, uh, but frankly, if you look at the relative cost of networking within the G within the AI cluster, it's not all that much, right? And so the risk reward on replacing it with something that may or may not work to me isn't all that high. So I do think once you're outside the cluster, you're going to go Ethernet, and through Ethernet might be good for that. But I and I so it'll it'll eat a, Ethernet will eat away at InfiniBand kind of at the margins, but. Infiniman's here for uh, for a while. There's markets for both, and this yeah, is where yeah. when you when you sit down with Charlie Kawas and people like that who have deep technical expertise, and he talks about you know open scale and power, it's like okay, this guy makes a lot of sense. And yeah. so I get I think the takeaway, John, is there's markets for both. Yeah, Broadcom and Nvidia will be the dominant. All right, guys, last question, real quick, um, as we wrap this analyst angle up. This is a he said the next decade, don't be asleep for this decade. We're two years in for the next 10 years. Jensen said that today. We've been saying that in the Cube. We wish we were 25 again. It's such a great run. We're still going to be paying attention and living this next 10 years. What's the impact of this NVIDIA GTC this year? I mean, outside, we're getting in the weeds, but mainstream, and people see the stock price, they know GPUs. This is a computer industry that's being redefined. And he's actually saying it's the new industrial revolution, obviously accelerated computing there at the head of the pack. What's the impact of this GTC? Dave, we'll start with you. Uh, that's going to, um, is it a mark in history? What's your takeaway of the impact of this year? I think it is a mark in history. I think people, you know, people are concerned. They're like, okay, when's NVIDIA going to run out of gas? What's the competition you know, look like? How, what does that mean for NVIDIA's stock price? I think we are in the early days of a data center super cycle and I think it's, it is going to morph the way that mobile and cloud changed our lives. I think it's going to be completely radical. He said within eight years, and I agree with him, we're going to have functional robots. So we're going to be talking to robots, and they're going to be doing these menial tasks around our homes, Good. and it's going to change the I way. Need that. I agree. It's going to change the way. You know, we have, to, we have to figure out other ways to get our exercise, but it's going to change the way in which that people live and work, and, and we're just in the early innings of a, of a 10 year data center super cycle. No robots on Cube, though, right? I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. No, I, I agree with you, and I think with AI, um, we've been talking about AI for a long time, so if you think of the typical hockey stick adoption of technology, I think the AI blade's been a little longer than you know cloud and things like that, but I think the shaft is going to be a lot steeper and a lot longer. 
And I do think we are in the very early innings here. One of the execs this morning in the, in the Q&A said uh, he thinks we're at first pitch, not even first inning. <laughs> Right, so from that standpoint, Nvidia's got a tremendous amount of runway. I think one of the other interesting things to think about, just from a capital markets perspective, is you know we're going to have some big tailwinds with AI. Who are the other companies that are going to take advantage of this? That some may have to burn themselves down, right, to be able to be reborn in this era. Uh, but um, I think there's some obvious ones like Pure Storage and Arista, maybe. But I right. think I, I think the rest of that ecosystem is yet to be written. Reinforced learning, big theme, tokens, grounded in truth. This is the AI future with the cube is here on the ground, running and gunning with a single camera. Nothing's going to stop us from getting the stories. We do whatever it takes to, to get that story out to you. And thanks for watching this analyst angle on the cube. We're in a systems revolution. Next 10 years is going to be a lot of fun, a lot of change, a lot of great opportunities to make a difference. We'll be there with you. Thanks for watching.